Can you guys hear me, guys? Can you hear me? Here's a story of a man named Brady. Man, look at my neck. It's skinny. Okay, guys, I'm at my brother's home. They're not here, so I'm using their internet. This is the internet that's not too strong, and it buffers real badly. So pray by the grace and mercy of the Triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the internet connection stays strong. It doesn't buffer too badly, and we don't lose our testimony because of its buffering in Jesus' name. Welcome. I was able to sneak in <clears throat> a live stream. Some people got upset with the clickbait titles, right? Sam, why are you running, bro? Well, because I need to lose weight first and last. I need another 50 pounds, slowly but surely. Andrew, good to see you. God bless every one of you in Jesus' name. David Joel Sostre. Stop looking in the mirror and you won't feel too depressed. <laughs> why, Sam? All right. Someone said here, Orthodox defense. You said that your priest is Assyrian? Good. See, my guys, my neck is really skinnier than before because I've lost weight, but still I got a chin. Chinny, chin, chin. All right. Orthodox defense, I guess. What are you, Assyrian as well? Guys, pray for the buffering to be as minimal. In fact, by the grace of Jesus Christ, our Lord, I pray it won't buffer at all. But I'm in my brother's house. Pray, guys. Pray in Jesus' name. Pray that it's a new year and that Jesus Christ, our Lord, will show up in a miraculous way for me. That I'll be completely free from all shackles of the devil. Devote myself entirely now to fall in love with Jesus more passionately, to be more like Jesus, to be holy unto the Lord, to be filled with wisdom and knowledge and power from the Spirit, to glorify Jesus Christ by my words, by my life, to bless you until Jesus Christ takes me home, to keep teaching by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ, because I want to go to a higher level. And I want to take you guys with me by the power of the Holy Spirit so we can be more in love with Jesus, more like Jesus, holier, pure, and righteous, and, and faithful, and obedient, and serving the Lord Jesus, preaching the gospel, living it out. And also loving people by our deeds, loving people by our actions for the glory of Jesus, right? That's what I want. I just want to finish the race. We're not going to be here forever. Who knows? We may die tonight, which is true. I just want to finish the race, glorify Jesus Christ, honor Jesus Christ, never shame Jesus, never blaspheme Jesus, never, never disgrace the name of Jesus Christ, right? Because until the Lord tarries, we're all going to die. We're not going to be here another 70 years from now, right? We're all going to be gone, some sooner than later. Some sooner than later. Our race has only just begun. Yeah, no, no, I don't know if that's the case. I'm 47. My race may end tonight. Don't forget, DFID. <clears throat> Nabil Qureshi is a reminder. Nabil Qureshi is a reminder. He was 34 years old, struck with stomach cancer, died, leaving behind a two-year-old two girl. Jesus Christ, our Lord, is a reminder. Our Lord Jesus Christ, who's God Almighty in the flesh, who is life. <clears throat> He's the one who sustains all creation by his powerful word with the Father and the Spirit as the one God. How long did he live on earth? Did Jesus live to be 80? No. Right? The Lord Jesus Christ at the most would have been late 30s, maybe even 40s. I say that because the assumption that Jesus was 33 is an assumption. See, someone said it, Mary M. That's an assumption. Jesus Christ, our Lord, may have been even older than that. Masayori. Hey, guys, can you do me a favor? I have a very bad lisp. When you guys come up with these weird nicks like Masayori, my lisp gets really bad. And I have to take a moment to learn how to pronounce your name. Masayori. I don't know too much about Ellen G. White. If she claimed to be a prophetess, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you, to be honest. <clears throat> One thing I don't like to do, and this is what I love about the brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ that I <clears throat> partner with, that I tag team with, for lack of a better term. Anthony Rogers, Vocab Malone, David Wood, 
John McRae, what do you mean? Adam Coleman, and even others like James White will not chime in, right? Will not speak on a topic that they have not studied and are well-versed in. And I love that. We don't want to just speak for the sake of speaking to impress people as if we have knowledge in all fields. We don't. I haven't taken time to study Ellen G. White, nor have I taken time to study Joseph Smith of Mormonism because you can either be a jack of all trades and an expert at nothing, or you can specialize and focus in specific areas and excel by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ in those areas, right? You get my point? So then someone will ask me, well, how do you deal with seven-day Adventists? Let me tell you something that I learned actually from Hank Hanegraaff, the Bible answer man. Even though he wasn't qualified to be the Bible answer man, he said that in the Treasury Department, they don't study every forgery, counterfeit bill. What they do is they study the genuine bill, the genuine dollar, and analyze and study it meticulously so that when a counterfeit arises, they can spot it automatically because they know what the real bill looks like, the genuine dollar looks like. With me? You understand the point? Oh, so DFIT, is that my friend Medic? Medic for Christ under another Nick? All right. I want to get over 200 in Jesus' name. Okay. So what's my point? If you know the true gospel of Jesus Christ, you know what the Bible teaches. When you count, when you encounter someone who brings a claim that's against the Bible, you'll automatically realize it and be able to correct it by the grace of God's Spirit without knowing what that person believes with great depth. Right? So in that area... I'm not intimidated to engage in dialogue with seven-day Adventists or Mormons because the moment they tell me something, I'll know by the grace of God's Spirit who's trained me, who has instructed me, who teaches me. And when I say me, I'm not saying me only. The role of the Holy Spirit is that he preserves the church in union with the Father and the Son. He guides the church. He sanctifies the church. He perfects the church. He instructs the church. He disciplines the church, he chastens the church, and transforms the church. So if you're walking in the Spirit and are filled with the Spirit, he'll guide you into all truth. So in a moment, a Seventh-day Adventist tells me something that's not scriptural, I'll realize it by the grace of the triumph God, right? Is that clear? Uh, the word, the, Jesus' name, Yeshua, appears in Ezra chapter 3, verse 2. Ezra chapter 3, verse 2, where there it says, Yeshua, the son of Jehozadak, Ben Jehozadak. But don't get into the Hebrew roots movement, right? Don't get into the Hebrew roots movement. So with that said, let's trust that the internet connection will stay strong. It won't buffer too bad because I'm here at my brother's place. I'm staying here until God opens the door for me to find my own place. And I need, again, a miracle. Pray for miraculous intervention for Thursday that these corrupt lawyers, these wicked agents of Satan will not try to freeze my account because then I'll be really in trouble financially because I need the money to take care of my kids and myself. So pray for a miracle in Jesus' name. Amen. But that's how corrupt this system is, that a, a corrupt, wicked judge can destroy you and then impose that decision and even freeze up your assets. That's how wicked this legal system is. And you wonder why America is becoming so dark and evil and wicked in light of how evil and wicked our legal system, our justice system, our po politicians have become. God will give you leaders after your own hearts. So if your leaders are corrupt, your judges are corrupt, your lawyers are corrupt, that means because the people are corrupt and God is fed up and he's handing people over to the desires of their heart. Amen. Running for the crown. Amen. Amen. Running for the crown. Right? The level of corruption in America is just shocking. Shocking. 
the number of divorces that's taking place in America is shocking and troubling. What? It's now what? Over 60%? It is so unbelievably dark and evil. And someone told me, by the way, someone told me a united church is a blessing from Jesus Christ. So when you see so much disunity among Christians, so much infighting among Christians and so much backbiting, that's a sign. That's another further sign. God is handing over a nation to judgment. It's become disgusting, right? And then it doesn't help when you have unwise counselors who think they're being a brother, but they're actually tools of Satan. I'll give you an example. We're going to begin. Exactly, Gerard Perry. May God swiftly bring judgment and destruction on these judges and shame them like the filthy dogs they are. I just had someone today supposedly showing me Christian love, and I tore into that person, and I just humiliated him. I'm sorry. He's like, yes, brother, uh, even though you're a jerk, I do pray that God saves you because you deserve. And I said, you think by calling me a jerk, you're actually endearing yourself to me? So I let him ha have it, and I reminded him what kind of dog he is, and I blocked him. Anyway. That's the kind of guy I am. I'm an equal opportunist defender. I will offend you equally. Yes. Yes, brother, I love you. You don't deserve this, even though you're a jerk. Yeah. I wish that dog would identify himself here because he knows he is, and he's supposedly a Syrian. Yeah, okay. Anyway, Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Father, we ask that you seal us by your spirit. Sanctify us by your spirit. Teach us by your spirit. Perfect us by your spirit. And empower us by your spirit to become more like your beloved son, the Lord Jesus. More like Jesus in patience and gentleness and self-control and love, compassion, mercy. But as well, more like Jesus in boldness and passion and fearlessness. Not to fear the power of darkness or even physical death, Father. And give us the grace to love one another with the love of Jesus Christ. And cover us with the blood of Jesus Christ. And cover our loved ones, my daughters, my angels. From you, Father, cover them with the blood of Jesus. Love them and fill them and seal them by your spirit. And everyone here, their children, their spouses, their families, Father, seal us by your spirit and wash us in the blood of Jesus Christ. Empower me by your spirit to recall and interpret scriptures perfectly and save me from error. And please, Father, save us from attacks of the enemy, his children from distracting us. Bind up all the powers of darkness that would come up against us and surround us with a wall of fire from your glorious Holy Spirit. And loosen my tongue to speak clearly and accurately without stammering, Father. And Father, please show up for us. Show up for me in a mighty way this Thursday. Please, Father, please. It's Christmas and a new year is about to dawn on us. And if it's your will for me to be around, please show up in a mighty way to be set free from these shackles so I can serve you in freedom. For the glory of Jesus Christ. We love you, Abba. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. And bless the internet connection in Jesus' name. Okay, folks. I don't know how strong the connection is going to be. Let me see something. Man, dude, my neck has really gotten skinnier from what I used to be. We were sailing along. And as you can see, I'm really taking my sweet time to lose the rest of the weight. The slower you do it, the better, you know. So we're going to continue where I left off yesterday on a moonlight bay. You know, guys, some people think that I got a good voice. I know there are certain tunes I can sing. And I'm wondering if I should try to, like, start singing to bring in some extra money so I can be financially set so I don't have to worry, so I can just focus on ministry. What do you think if I start a career singing, you know? I do a mean Elvis, and I mean a mean Elvis when Elvis is mean. Well, hey, man, contact me running for the crown because I don't want to be running from a, from any prison cell, right? You know, I can do – that's okay. Hey, Rob Christian, can I – brother, Rob, Rob Christian, can I ask you something, brother, honestly? Can I can, – can, would you answer me honestly, Rob Christian? And I said, excuse me, my brother, are you a, a dhimmi of uh, Muhammad Ijab or these Muslims? Are you one of their dhimmi? Do you like pay them jizya?
I just want to say, okay. So then, Rob, why are you here telling me what they're doing? Why are you here as their agent telling me what they're doing, brother? Do you understand you're falling for their trap and you're becoming a useful idiot when you come and report that they're stalking me on Twitter? You guys don't understand that, right? That's what they want you to do. They want you to be their pawns, their puppets, to run and give them free publicity and advertisement. So you see again, Rob, you don't get it, but you are a useful idiot when you run to me and tell me what they're doing. So you are being used of them. You're falling for their trap. You understand, Rob? I'm not hard to find. I told him we will fight legally and I'll put him and his girlfriend in a coma if they threaten to attack me. But we're going to debate first that Muhammad prostituted women like his mother in the name of his God. So, Rob, don't help them by being their messenger boy. Okay? You understand, Rob? And I want this for everyone here. Folks, the Muslims want you go around spreading their message for them. You guys are not their dhimmis. You're not useful idiots. Don't go and be their messenger boy or girl saying, oh, Sam, did you see he's haunting you on Twitter? Gee, Rob, that really helped me. How does that help me, Rob? Yeah, Rob, I know you're an enemy of Islam for the glory of Christ, but sometimes you need to think, brother, think. Folks, think, think. If they're hounding me on Twitter, that means I'm permanently parked in his head. I'm his nightmare. He can't get rid of me. He knows I humiliated him and his prophet and his God, and I buried them further in hell by the grace of Jesus, which is why he's going to hound me because I called out his bluff. So you just wasted our time, Rob, because you turned it about Muhammad Hijab, which he wants. He wants us to talk about him and waste our time. Rob, can I come on your channel and we talk about Muhammad Hijab and how he's hounding you? Rob, that tells me if he's not hounding you, then you're a joke. You know that, right? If he's not hounding your Twitter, then you're a joke and he considers you <clears throat> worthless enough for him to pursue. But it means I must be important. And Christian Prince must be important. David Wood is important, but not you. You see? You see, Rob? It's not the only time I've had issues with you, brother. No, they don't, Rob. You're a liar. You're lying. You just now want to make yourself feel good that they're after you. No, you're 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 a waste. You're useless. You're a joke. You can't refute Islam. You see? You see that, brother? Sorry, folks, sometimes I have to rebuke Christians more severely than Muslims because sometimes Christians don't think, and it, it kills me when Christians don't think. <sighs> Lord, have mercy on us. My God, please save us from our flesh and save us from instigation of the evil one. Yeah, I know. In your own imagination, he rocks. Right? We were sailing on. Yes, I agree with you. You're not important. You're nobody, even though you're trying to have this false sense of humility. You are a nobody, and I agree with you. You're a nobody, and you're not important. But obviously, Muhammad Hijab is important for you because he's in your head, and you're his messenger boy. Right? No, understand, brethren, brethren. I don't want to make my YouTube channel a teaching lesson or church discipline. You know why? Let me explain to you. Let me explain to you why. I am not your pastor. See, I'm going to waste time now because of Rob being a useful idiot, being used of Muhammad Hijab, who's parked in his head, right? Because he's a useful idiot, Rob. Okay. Let me explain to you. I am not a pastor. I'm not a pastor. This is not a church. This is... A Bible study where I try to teach you the meaning of Scripture so you can learn the depth of Scripture and take it back to your own congregation, to your own church, to your own people. It is the job of the church, the job of pastors or bishops to discipline, to chase and rebuke Christians that need to be disciplined and rebuked. I am not a bishop 
I'm not a pastor. I don't want to rebuke people and chasten people, discipline people, or teach people how to think critically and not be stupid or useful idiots for the enemies of the gospel to be used as agents of the devil. You get my point? You understand? So it gets tiring where I have Christians come here and then I have to chasten them and discipline them and rebuke them and be harsh with them. That is not my role because I am not your pastor. I am not your bishop. This is why you need to be <clears throat> regularly attending a local church, a local body of believers, finding mature men of God who are approved of God to lead the flock that you're accountable to. Right? You understand my point, right? You understand? Folks, these sessions are meant to help you understand and explore the depth of the Bible and refute objections against the Bible by the sons and daughters of the devil until they repent and give their life to Christ. Okay? So let's try not to be used of Muslims or Jehovah's Witnesses to be their messenger boy or girl. Can we do that? Can we do that? No, Rob, I'm going to move on when you leave. You need to leave, brother. I don't want you here. Can you leave, Rob Christian? Help me to be happy. Can you leave, brother? And D. Joel, can you leave too? D. Joel, please leave. Both of you guys leave. Make it easy for me. D. Joel, can you leave? You got to leave. Honestly, you got to leave. I'm going to clean house. By the time I'm done, we're only going to have sincere Christians who know how to behave themselves here to get the most out of these sessions. Bye-bye, Dijo. You need to go. You got to go. Okay, sorry about that, brother. I promise you, be patient. Pray for me to be patient that Jesus doesn't get angry with me when I have to discipline people that I don't want to discipline. But this channel, people are going to realize, animal, you need to leave too, brother. Can you leave? I don't want people like you here. I don't know how much clear I want. Get out of here, please. Leave. Don't come back. This channel, guys, understand. Listen to me. Listen. This channel, in time, by the grace of God, is only going to be for the serious-minded Christian students who want to go deep by the power of the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit deepens our understanding in scriptures. And we're all going to be on the same page. And we're going to get the most out of these sessions because we're going to be on the same page and we won't cause each other to stumble. Let me make it clear because I just wasted time because of Rob Christian. I do not want, I do not want just anybody here. I don't just want anybody here. And I'm telling you, go somewhere else. You don't need me. I Guys, can I make it any clearer? How many times I've told you I'm not going to appeal to everyone. Not everyone's going to like me or my style. Why do you come here? Go to someone else. I, I mean, how many times have I said that? Can you bear witness I've said that? How many times have I said that? If you're able to be patient and work with me, I promise you, you'll get the most out of these sessions and you'll be blessed in a way by the power of the Holy Spirit and you'll be blown away, not because of me, because I am nothing. Here, for the record, apart from Jesus, apart from the Holy Spirit, I am a wicked dog. Honest to God, I am a wicked, evil, filthy dog if the Holy Spirit leaves me. No, I'm not I'm lucky. I'm not actually spoiled. I'm actually passionate right now, and I'm, and I'm being very zealous because luck, lucky old bills. I, I'm getting tired of sounding like a broken record, repeating myself. But shalom, Lord, we will avoid these guys because right when they show up, the admins who are quick to the job will start banning them. Okay. Now, with that said, by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ, and folks, by the way, let me tell you something. You're not going to impress me just because you're in ministry and you're refuting Muslims that somehow that's going to give you a free pass with me. If you're a jerk, you're a jerk. If you're stupid, you're stupid, and I'm going to treat you the same way. And that's one thing I hope you love about me. I'm an equal opportunist defender. I don't show partiality. Right? Hope you like that. Say everyone's – Rob Christian, you're phenomenal. In your mind, he's phenomenal. 
Only in your mirage, he's phenomenal. Rob, great session today. Yeah, all right. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, with that said, let's begin, guys. Can we now focus now? Yeah. Yep. Let's focus, brethren. Folks, let me tell you why I've titled these things the way I did. It's called clickbait. And by the way, you know where I picked this up? I picked it up from Christian Prince. Christian Prince will often put such titles like Christian Prince is afraid of so-and-so because he knows that's going to drag more people and I'm going to weed them out by the grace of God's spirit because then some people come there sincere. They're going to learn, but then we're going to get the trolls and we're going to weed them out. So he's been doing that. And I picked it up. I said, let me try it. Someone got upset at me. Some guy named Alpha. Yeah, I was a little annoyed. Well, he that annoyed you? <laughs> Boy, stick around. Right. Anyway. With that said, let's begin. We're going to continue where we left off from yesterday. Yeah, I like that, Rachel. Sam, why don't you? Uh, Daily night, why don't you tell me how to run my life? Can you tell me how to spend my money too and what movies I should go see? And <laughs> oh, boy. Daily light, I'm, I'm technically illiterate. Daily Light, I'm technically illiterate. I really don't know how to make the most out of technology, even YouTube. David Wood is a whiz at this, and Christian Prince, they know how to get the most out of the YouTube, like the way they tag. I am an ignoramus. I don't know how to do any of this. I don't have the patience for it, but I need patience, and I need someone to walk me through this. But anyway, yesterday we ended our discussion, if you remember. Yesterday... Jonathan Simon, if you go back, I retitle the videos, right? If you went look, I retitled them. So when you say it's difficult, how is it difficult when I retitle them and I put in the description box a brief description of the topic? So I don't get it. Anyway, yesterday, apologies. We were talking about who the sons of God were in Genesis 6, verses 1 and 4. And I think. I made a quite uh, quite strong case intertextually, meaning within the context of the Bible, the canon of the Bible, what they call intertextuality, how these books of the Bible all relate to one another and help us understand, let's say, I read something in Genesis and the other books in the Pentateuch Help me understand that statement in Genesis much better. And then when I read that statement in light of the full canon of Scripture, how other <clears throat> believers throughout the ages understood those statements, particularly the apostles, right? Intertextuality, right, basically. I think I made a strong case from Second Peter and Jude, and the fact that Jude references and alludes to the book of Enoch, that the sons of God in Genesis 6 are angels, right? I think I made a case that was quite strong and persuasive that they're angels. Now, for the record, I just want to be clear. If you disagree with the angelic interpretation, we can agree to disagree. Because I know there are two other views. There's the Sethite view. Man, that word is hard on my lisp. Sethite view, that these were the sons of Seth, marrying with the daughters of Cain and thereby corrupting themselves. And others held the view that the sons of God were these mighty rulers, mighty kings, these tyrants on earth that thought they were divine, that pretty much slept with mere mortals, so to speak, even though they were mortal. So there, those are the three views. If you happen to reject the angelic view, that's okay. That's okay. Are you listening? That's okay. You can agree to disagree without being disagreeable. Just don't condemn someone who holds to a contrary position. So if you don't believe they're angels, I'm not going to condemn you. Yeah. And inspiring philosophy can hold to any position he wants. He's entitled to it, right? <clears throat> and if that's what he's convinced, he's convinced. However, intertextually and historically, as far as the book of Enoch is concerned, which was referenced by Jude, alluded to by Jude. And in fact, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, 
believes the book of Enoch is canonical scripture. It's part of their canon. Did you know that? The Ethiopian Orthodox Church has 81 books in their canon of the Bible. One of the books that they accept as scripture, one of the books that they accept as scripture is Enoch. And there were church fathers like Tertullian, church fathers like Tertullian who thought Enoch was inspired scripture. Did you know that? Because there are plentiful allusions to the book of Enoch throughout the New Testament, and particularly in Jude. So the fact that you have such allusions to Enoch and you have Jude even citing Enoch authoritatively, it's pretty hard to get around the angelic view of Genesis 6 when the book of Enoch not only tells us they were angels, but even names the chief of those angels, right? Do you remember that? It's in the sixth chapter of the book of Enoch, a copy of which, a portion of which was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls in the Qumran. Right? So unless I, I hear convincing proofs for the other positions, in my view, and again, I'm not all-knowing, the angelic interpretation remains solid and, as far as I'm concerned, irrefutable. Right? As far as I'm concerned. Because Second Peter and Jude presuppose that the story of fallen angels who are consigned to judgment will be found somewhere in the canonical Old Testament, the books of the Old Testament, that their audience were familiar with and were reading. And the only story that you have that would fit angelic rebellion, whom God then consigned to outer darkness, to chains until the day of judgment, is Genesis 6, right? As the Lord loosens my tongue to speak for the glory of Christ. With me there? It's very hard to get around that kind of evidence. But let's deal with some of the implications of that. If these sons of God were angels. How can angels sire children, get women pregnant when they're not physical beings, right? That's an objection you often hear. The objection you hear is, well, angels are not physical beings. How can they sire children, get women pregnant? That troubles a lot of people. Now, before I even... Venture to discuss that by the grace of God's Spirit, trusting the Spirit to guide me to speak clearly for the glory of Christ. Because, again, I need the Holy Spirit to help me, to crucify my flesh, keep me humble and teachable, and save me from unrighteous anger, but also strengthen me in my righteous anger and zeal to clean house for the glory of Jesus Christ, right? Let's go to Genesis 6, verse 4, because oftentimes people tell me, were the Nephilim or Nephilim, the Nephilim, Nephilim, were they the offspring of the sons of God through these women, right? The Nephilim, Nephilim. Nephilim. Okay. Genesis 6, verse 4. Let's read. There were giants. That's the word Nephilim. 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 Giants is the word Nephilim in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them. Let's reread it again. We're going to have to reread read it more than once to sink in because we have a bad habit of reading something too fast, too quickly, and we miss the meat of the passage. You know that, right? In Jesus' name, a bless and anoint this session with such power that we stand in awe of the Word of God and fall more in love with Jesus. Okay. We often read things on a surface level. And because of that, we miss the meat of the passage. Or you should say that Greek mythology sounds like the Bible because you're moon god Allah. See, again, I don't know if I should just chasten you for being that stupid to make such a comment. You understand behind every myth, there is a kernel of historical truth. Myth is not something that simply is made up. Myth is taking an historical event and then... <clears throat> mythologizing it, adding and embellishing it. Who told you that myth is simply fiction, fantasy, make-believe that's not anchored in some historical truth? So I don't know how to answer this guy. He's got a name mocking Allah, young moon god Allah, 
but then he takes a swipe at the scriptures. So I don't know if this guy's a Bible believer or he's an enemy who wants to say something stupid. So invites me to then embarrass him. I don't know. Right? Folks, let me tell you what myth isn't. Myth isn't some, simply something you make up out of thin air. Right? Myth is something based on an historical event that has been embellished and blown up over time. Right? Myth doesn't simply refer to fantasy like Alice in Wonderland. Myth doesn't simply refer to fairy tales. Myth, if you look at it from this angle and perspective, means a story that's been embellished and blown up that was based off of an historical event, something in history that in time became embellished and became blown up and made more colorful. Colorful. That's like the flood stories. What do you find common among all ancient civilizations? A flood story and a visitation, an infestation of the gods to the earth, right? Right? Admins, if you find distractions, I send them on their merry way. So you have this filthy dog, Ab Abigail Bueno, think I'm disgracing myself when I'm going to humiliate Abigail. And she's not like Abigail. She's more like Nebel the fool. You can download any video you want. Just don't sell and make money and, don't sell and, and then hoard it for yourself. Okay. What you find in ancient civilizations, common to ancient civilizations, is a story about the flood and an infestation of gods to the earth, right? Right? Isn't that true? All throughout these civilizations even separated by, by seas and oceans, you find at least two stories in common among all of them. A worldwide flood and an infestation of gods to the earth. Now you can say that it's coincidental that they all have these two stories in common, or you can say that the reason why these civilizations, though separated by seas and oceans, have these stories in common is because they're all descendants of Noah. And as they spread throughout the earth, they took these historical facts, but then embellished them, blew them up, right? <clears throat> Started switching the details, embellishing the stories, and then basically perverting the stories by attributing these actions to gods and goddesses that they started worshiping. Right? Am I making sense or I'm, I'm putting you guys to sleep? Do you understand? So instead of assuming these are fairy tales, make-believe stories, see the fact that all these cultures hold these stories in common, that these stories must have originated in some historical event in the past, but as time went on, the descendants of those peoples or the descendants of the survivors of the flood took those stories with them, passed them on, and embellished them, blew them up, changed the details, and then as they started worshiping gods and goddesses, ascribed those actions to their gods and goddesses so that by the time we get to these civilizations and the record of these events, the true details of these historical fa facts have been lost and what we have in the Bible is a restoration of what actually happened. Right? And why do I say that the biblical story gives us the actual version of these events? The true historical record of these events? Why am I staking all my confidence in the Bible? Because of Jesus Christ. Because of Jesus Christ. Uh, Festu, why do you care if I work on myself or not? Why are you here? Why are you here such like a filthy dog of Satan? If you don't like it, get out of here. Stop barking. You're going to get muzzled. Anyway, what, everyone here with me? I know. These are the children of Satan. Just, they don't like my personality. Gee, I'm going to lose sleep over that. 
Exactly, Billy Mandalay, the view of Tolkien and C.S. Lewis. Now, why do I believe that the Bible gives us the actual version of these events? It's the accurate historical record of these events. Because Jesus confirmed the Old Testament, confirmed the Hebrew Bible as being God's revelation and historically reliable, and then left the tomb empty to confirm that we can take whatever he says for, for granted and know that everything he says is absolutely true. Jesus did not confirm the epics of Gilgamesh or the epic of Gilgamesh, right? He did not confirm the Anuma Elish. He confirmed the Hebrew Bible. And he left the tomb empty, conquering death, raising himself immortal to give us absolute confidence that what he says is absolutely true. So if he says that Noah was in the ark, not Utnapushtum, then my money is on Jesus. It was Noah, not some man named Utnapushtum. You get it? You see why? I accept the Old Testament record as the true version of these historical events because my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the God-man, confirmed the Old Testament, perfectly fulfilled the Old Testament, and amen the Old Testament as the true word of God, historically accurate, preserved by God as a witness to the coming of the God-man. He now left the tomb empty, rising immortal, to give us absolute confidence that what he says is absolutely true and he says it's Noah not Utna Pushtim right that's why I believe the Old Testament version of these events folks let's be honest with each other let's be honest with each other had our Lord Jesus Christ not confirmed the Old Testament, its historical accuracy, and that it's the revealed Word of God, who among us Gentiles would even bother with the Old Testament? If Jesus did not amen the Old Testament as God's revelation, which one of us Gentiles, who are not ethnically Jews, would even waste our time trying to show that there are no real contradictions in the Old Testament and everything that God did in the Old Testament is absolutely just and righteous, good, and perfect. Even the command to slaughter the Canaanites. Do you think if Jesus did not confirm the Old Testament, I would waste my time trying to defend those commands in the Old Testament? So if you're a Christian and you love Jesus, and you trust he's the God-man, and he is alive, and he left the tomb empty, conquering death, rising immortal on the third day, all of which is true. He did rise from the dead. He is alive. He is not dead. He is reality. He does live. Then you're stuck with the Old Testament. You're stuck with it. Right? That's why I don't accept the Epic of Gilgamesh. That's why I don't accept the Enuma Elish. Everyone want to pronounce it. Jesus bound me to the Old Testament. I am stuck with it. Exactly, Defid. Right? Some of the best defenses of the Old Testament, its historical accuracy and God's command to wipe out rebellious nations, come from Christians. who love Jesus, and because they love Jesus, they love the Old Testament and are stuck with it. You get my point? Am I making sense or am I torturing you with all this? Zine and everyone else. You see why? I'm passionate about the Hebrew Scriptures, and I try to find Jesus in the Hebrew Bible and show its miraculous consistency and supernatural design because Jesus binds me to the Hebrew Bible. Right? See? I hope that's clear. So when someone tells me sounds like Greek mythology, that either is someone who's an ignoramus, 
or just trying to cause trouble because who told you that quote unquote Greek mythology is not anchored in historical facts? For example, if we take the story of the sons of God siring women and having offspring from them, and their offspring became mighty men of renown with supernatural intelligence and power, that would explain the story of a Hercules. Hello? I'm not saying Hercules existed, but I'm saying a story of a figure like Hercules, whose father was divine and mother was a human, who got pregnant, by a god producing a supernatural human, a demigod? Well, we see why such stories would be <clears throat> created because they are based on that one historical event of angelic beings, fallen beings, impregnating women, and their children becoming mighty men. So it's not that Hercules is completely... Fairy tale. I'm not what I mean is I'm not saying a Hercules existed, but the idea of a Hercules is anchored in an historical event where such individuals who were like Hercules did exist. Right? Thank you, JC Denton. So again, for the record, I don't want people misquote me. I'm not saying I believe Hercules existed. If he did, I wouldn't be shocked, wouldn't be surprised. It would only <clears throat> confirm what I'm saying. If he didn't, no problem. But the notion of a Hercules is not simply fairy tale, something that was just created out of nothing. Hercules was created <clears throat> from the fact that at some point in the distant past, such individuals like Hercules did roam the earth that God destroyed in the flood. Right? Am I making sense here? I just hope I'm making sense so you understand how to deal with the assertion. These stories sound like myth. These stories sound like fairy tales. No, you're a moron. You're an idiot. You don't know what myth is. Myth isn't simply the idea of creating a story out of thin air, just making up some story. Typically, when we speak of myth, especially in its ancient context, we're talking about events that are anchored in history that is based off actual historical events, but what happened is those events that transpired have now been changed, embellished, blown up, right, with a lot of color and flavoring added to them. Okay? So I hope I'm making sense. I hope I'm not. I Hearing myself, I torture myself. I put myself to sleep. I just want to show you how to deal with the assertion that these are myths, right? A myth is not necessarily a fable. And even a fable, when you say fable, a fable can be based on something that happened, but like I said, has been embellished, blown up, changed, right? And quote unquote, colorized. And I'm repeating myself more than once so it can sink in by the grace of God and become second nature so that now you know how to refute that assertion. Right? Do we... Is that clear? Did it sink in? Did it make sense? Are you getting it? Okay, just want to make sure. Don't define myth according to 21st century skeptical understanding. A skeptic, an atheist, agnostic, a materialist who doesn't believe in the spirit realm and doesn't believe that you can have myths built around actual historical events. Exactly, Bill Mandalay. I want you to read what Bill Mandalay just said. He just said, he mentioned C.K. Tolkien and also C.S. Lewis, Lewis, right? And they said Christianity is the myth that is true. And what they meant was these myths were all pointing to the true myth of Jesus. And they weren't using myth to mean a fairy tale, a fable, 
some fictional story, something make-believe. Okay? Now let's go back to Genesis 6, verse 4. You can thank that guy, that pagan, stone worshiper, your God, your God, Allah is the moon, I guess. That's what he said. For even bringing up this objection, because then I went on a tangent. Hopefully that tangent was from the spirit and it will bless you for the glory of Christ. Okay. I hope it blessed you. What's up, Al? Now, Genesis 6, 4. Let's reread it because oftentimes we read something so fast that we miss the details and the meat of the passage. And I'm trusting the spirit to guide me to be a blessing to you. I don't want to torture you. And bore you, I really want to be used the Lord to serve you for the glory of Christ. Genesis 6, verse 4. Watch here. One more time. And thank Protestant for being patient and tolerating my nonsense. The front end, it's okay. Protestant will be posting, brother. Thank you. Watch here. There were giants, Nephilim, Nephilim. In the earth, giants is Hebrew word Nephilim. In the earth in those days and also after that. See, you guys are not going to pay attention because you read something fast. You read something quickly. Pay attention. There were giants in the earth in those days and also after that when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them. Now, again, I'm going to test you. That's what the, the purpose of these sessions is to drill you, challenge you, Put pressure on you so that by the grace of God, by the grace of God's spirit, you learn to think more deeply and read more slowly, simmer on the passage until you fully understand it. And it sinks in and becomes second nature by the grace of God's spirit. So now you can teach others. Genesis 6, 4. I don't know if you caught it. Okay. It says, now there were giants in those days and then afterwards. There were giants in those days and then afterwards. First question for every one of you. When it says there were giants in those days, what days is the author referring to? What days does the author have in mind? You got it. The days leading up to the flood. The days before the flood. The days leading up to the flood. Thank you. But then it says there were giants before the days of the flood and then after that. So there were giants after when? When were there giants before the flood? And then it says after that. After when? Hey, Sai Christian, good to see you. Pray for me for Thursday, bro. Okay, you got it. Guys, can I ask you? How can you have giants existing after the flood if the giants are the offspring of the angelic sons of God with earthly women? Are you saying that another <clears throat> influx of angelic beings sired women even after the flood? See, that's why I say read carefully. Read slowly. Let's look at it again. Genesis 6, verse 4. Because if you actually read the passage, the passage doesn't necessarily say the Nephilim are the offspring of the sons of God. Okay? Here, let's reread it, guys. Pay attention. There were giants in the earth in those days and also after that. So before and after the flood, there were giants, Nephilim, Nephilim. Now, let me tell you where this word giants appears again in the Pentateuch, the books of Moses. Numbers 13, 31 to 33, pay attention to verse 33. Numbers 13, 31 to 33, pay attention to verse 33. Sai Christian, you got to listen to yesterday's session. I provided a full exposition of who the sons of God were. They're not humans, they're angels. Numbers 13, 31 to 33. Pay attention to 33, okay? But the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel saying, 
The land through which we have gone to search, it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. Notice 33. And there we saw the giants. Guess what the Hebrew word is? Nephilim. Nephilim. We saw the Nephilim in Canaan, Moses, during the time of the Exodus. The sons of Anak. Oh, wow. Notice the Nephilim are not the sons of the angels. They're the sons of a human being named Anak. And Anak is a Canaanite, a descendant of Ham. <whistles> the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, so we were in their sight. Anak is a Canaanite. Right? He's a descendant of Canaan who is a son of Ham. And yet he and his children are Nephilim, Nephilim, they're giants. And they were there at the time of Moses. So are the giants the offspring of the angelic sons of God? Or are the giants some other group distinguished from the offspring of the angelic sons of God. Folks, if you read the Bible carefully, the Nephilim, the Nephilim are not the offspring of the angels. They're a group of human beings who are excessively huge. Goliath is one of them, but they arise from the human gene pool. They're from the gene pool of the human race, they're not the byproduct of angels sleeping with women. In our gene pool, human gene pool, we have the capacity to produce dwarfs and giants. Dwarfs and giants. That's in our gene pool. So it is a misunderstanding as far as I'm concerned that the Nephilim were the children of the angels. No, no. The children of the angels were there when the Nephilim were there. They existed side by side. Let's reread Genesis 6 verse 4 again. Exactly, front end. Let's read Genesis 6 verse 4 again. This is what happens when you don't read carefully and you simply parrot what you hear others telling you, traditions of men, even if they're ancient traditions. Front end. You didn't hear what I just said, right? Let me repeat it again, front end. This is what happens when you parrot traditions of men, even if they're ancient traditions, and you just did what I just said. This is what happens when you do it. Right? Genesis 6, verse 4. You said you want to be biblical. You guys want to be biblicist. Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5.21, Test all things. So we're going to test everything, even what I have to say. Trusting Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth for the glory of Christ and save us from error, save us from sin, Holy Spirit. Fill us with love for Jesus and teach us to think your thoughts after you. In Jesus' name. Okay. Genesis 6, 4. Let's reread it. Now let's reread it carefully. There were giants in the earth in those days. Reread it, guys. And also after that, so there were giants before and after the flood. We saw when these giants showed up after the flood, they were there in Canaan during the time of Moses. And they're said to be the sons of Anak. Anak is not an angel or a an hybrid of angels and humans. Anak is a descendant of Canaan. Canaan is the son of Ham, the son of Noah. They're from the human gene pool. Thank you, Freedom in Christ. And you got you humongous basketball player. In fact, if you look at Goliath's height, he was a Nephilim. And Goliath was about nine feet tall. So these giants, when we talk about giants, we're not talking about 20, 30 feet people. We're talking about people eight feet, nine feet, over seven feet. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar would have been called a giant at the time of Moses. Dodge, you probably didn't understand what I said earlier. A cyclop would be a mythologizing 
of this historical event. Remember what I said? You take an historical event and you embellish it and make it more than it is and you colorize it. Right? Genesis 6 verse 4. One more time. One more time. Let's read it now. Because I want you to read the latter part. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. Did you catch it? It did not say the Nephilim are the children that the woman bore to the sons of God. It says the giants were there when the sons of God had children born to them. Exactly, fish bones. You got it. The Greeks tend to over-exaggerate things, although it's a mixture of half-truth. Exactly. Most cultures did that. Okay. Do you see? There are two groups in Genesis 6. The children of the sons of God, which the women bore to them, and the Nephilim. They're not the same group. Though some people read them as if they are. Reread it. You'll see there are two groups. Sons of God. That the woman bore for the, I'm sorry, the children that the woman bore for the sons of God and the Nephilim. Two groups. You got it? No, Paul Sinems. You, you, you're chiming in again, Paul Simons. And you didn't listen to yesterday's session. Don't chime in, brother. No, it's not their spiritual status. The sons of God are angelic creatures. Do you guys want Protestant to post the verse one more time? So you can see there are two groups, the Nephilim and the children that the woman bore for the sons of God. You want to post it one more time? Protestant, go ahead. Judge, what's Aristotle and Cyclops got to do with my topic, brother? Okay, Z and everyone else, read it. There were giants in the earth those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. You caught it? It says the giants were there when the sons of God had children with women. Now, some can read it as if, the Nephilim are the children of the sons of God. Or, if you read it carefully, the Nephilim were there when the sons of God had children by women. And then the reference to the Nephilim, the same became mighty men which are of old, men of renown. That can also be taken in reference to the sons of God. But notice, it says they became men of renown. Much like you have a Hercules. In fact, forget Hercules. That's the Greek mythology. For the Assyrians, Galgamesh. Galgamesh's Gal mother was a goddess, and his father was a human priest, the priest of the goddess, I believe, Ninurga. That was her name. Going by memory now. Don't condemn me if I'm wrong. Did you know that? And Galgamesh is said to be the fifth king of Uruk after the flood. Right? Well, Defid, the offspring of the sons of God would be men still because human women are giving birth to them. Thank you, Dodge. So Gelgemish was a mighty man of renown. He is renowned for his exploits. Right? Why? Because he had supernatural potencies because it was believed that his mother was a goddess that slept with her human priest. Thank you, front end. Front end, do you guys noticing the pattern here? All these ancient civilizations having stories of hybrids from gods, goddesses, and humans, and a flood story because these stories are not fake. They're not fairy tales. They're based on historical events that these cultures then embellished and blew out of proportion. What more proof do you want that these events took place and the Bible is historically accurate than the fact that even in 
among Indians, India, Greeks, Mesopotamians, you have these stories circulating. Right? And you see the demonic influence and intent behind these stories. Notice that these cultures took these gods and goddesses as divine figures worthy of their worship and their fear and devotion. Precisely what we'd expect fallen rebellious angels to do. Mislead people from the true God. Now, Zarina said something beautiful. Something beautiful. She said, even comics have them. What do you think comic books are but a modern form of ancient myth? Comics are modern form of ancient myth where you have gods and goddesses visiting from other planets like Superman. In point of fact, Thor is not a comic book figure. Thor and Odin, these are the gods of the Norse religion. Did you know that? And Wonder Woman, she keeps saying great Hera and Diana. These are goddesses of pagan mythology. No, I don't really care about his video, to be honest. He can conclude anything he wants, Peter D. Did you understand Thor, Loki, Odin? These are not comic book figures. These are the gods of the Norse religion. So comic books are the modern form of ancient myths. So when you're reading comics, you're doing what the ancients did. Reading stories of gods and goddesses. Exactly, front end. Is everything make... Now, guys, look what you're learning. You're learning that if you plunge deep into the Bible, the Bible explains everything around you. It explains reality perfectly because it comes from the creator of reality. Now the myths make sense, don't they? Right? It's all making sense. It all fits if you let the Bible be the lens through which you see reality because the Bible is God's lenses for you to see things the way God sees it, and God sees reality perfectly because he's the creator whose perception is perfect. Is it, is it making sense? Before I move on? Even aliens, if they're real, and when I say real, I'm not talking about they're extraterrestrial. They're not from the physical universe. If aliens are real, this again would be understandable light of John 6 because that means we're now having another influx of rebellious angelic creatures coming to the earth to do to man what that influx of angelic creatures did before the flood. Corrupt the human race, corrupt the human gene pool, and mislead them from the worship of God, looking to them as the agents that started life on earth, right? Right? You see, if you understand the Bible and plunge the depth of the Bible, and ask the Holy Spirit to allow you to understand it correctly and absorb it and live it out, it will help you make sense of everything that's taking place around you. Right? Front end. What you have in Genesis 6 is an attempt of the angelic beings to corrupt the human gene pool, to pollute it and taint it. 
Guys, and that leads me to another thing, and I don't want you to take my word for it. Someone mentioned it yesterday. I think you can even read it online. It's called the Genesis Apocryphon. The Genesis Apocryphon. This is an Aramaic paraphrase of Genesis found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, let me explain to you the significance of this. I actually have it. I read it. Not all of it, but that re re uh, relevant part. Let's go to Genesis 6, 8 to 9. Genesis 6, 8 to 9. Now, it's called the Genesis Apocryphon. Apocryphon. A-P-O-C-R-Y-P-H-O-N. And it's an Aramaic paraphrase of Genesis found in the Dead Sea Scrolls written before Christ. I'm going to explain to you the significance of this. It's based off of Genesis 6, verse 8. Okay? But we're going to read 8 and 9. Genesis 6, verse 9. I'm sorry, but 8 and 9. But Noah found grace in the eyes of Jehovah. Genesis 6, 8 to 9. Noah found grace in the eyes of Jehovah. Now read 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah is just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. People may not realize, but when it says these are the generations of Noah, that's referring to what? Right? No, don't blo don't block Shalom, Lord. That shows their stupidity and ignorance because Jesus is talking to, to his contemporaries and he's speaking in their language on their level. These are the genealogies. Of Noah. It's talking about his physical lineage, right? Physical lineage. So when it says that Noah was perfect in his generations, you know what the author is telling you? That Noah's lineage was kept pure. It was perfect. It had not been tainted by the angelic insemination. Do you know that? It's on about that his line, his physical line, had not been contaminated by the angelic insemination. His line had been kept pure from such contamination. You know that? Does anyone remember what Noah's father's name was? What was his father's name? Does anyone know? What was his father's name? Lemmech, right? Well, check. Confirm. Who's got it right? Did you know what the Genesis Apocryphon states? Amram? That's, you, you're kidding me, right, Dodge? Amram? Okay. You know what the Genesis Apocryphon states? This Aramaic paraphrase of Genesis produced by the community that produced the Dead Sea Scrolls. You know what it says? It says that Lemmech went to his wife when she got pregnant and asked her whether she got pregnant by the Watchers. And she said, no, you got me pregnant. This is not an offspring of the Watchers. Meaning that even the Jews that produced this paraphrase of Genesis understood that Genesis 6-9 was confirming that Noah was not the hybrid, the offspring of the angels impregnating his mother. Noah, his line had been kept pure and uncontaminated, untainted. It's called Apocryphon, P-H-O-N, Apocryphon. Not apocrypha. Do you know that? You understand what Genesis 6 is stating? It's stating that the sons of God contaminated, polluted the human gene pool, but God in his sovereign power, in his infinite power, preserved a gene pool that was pure and untaminated, Unstained. Exactly, DFID. DFID said, this shows you how the Jews that produced the Genesis Apocryphon understood that story in Genesis. Paul Simons, yes, they can. That's the entire point discussion. Don't tell me what you think angels can and cannot do. You're not God. You don't have access to heaven. You tell me what the scripture says. You already assume they can't have sex because even the nature of your question and what you said earlier tells me that you think you know more about heaven than you actually do.
right? And that's going to lead me to my other discussion. Jojo, it's important for that very reason. Genesis 5 gives us the pure line, the pure physical lineage that God preserved miraculously from being tainted. That's why you have Genesis 5. Exactly, Grace Girl. They were strict for that specific reason. Is it making sense to everyone, Zena, everyone else? Are you able to see with greater clarity by the grace of God's Spirit, provided He's guiding me to speak truth without error? Are you seeing the depth of Scripture and how even extra biblical sources, these sources, these so called myths, confirm this history of the Bible? Whether they have or not, Remy, I could care less. Clear? Everyone getting it? Just want to make sure before I move on to the next point. Because I want to answer this question. I want to answer this question. Since angels are not physical beings composed of earthly matter, how can they have sex with women? Let me ask you a question. Since angels are not physical beings, they're not composed of earthly matter, how can angels eat human food and digest it? Because if you go to Genesis 18 and you take the traditional interpretation, that's God and two angels appearing. Three men appear, two of whom are said to be angels in Genesis 19. Now, you can make a strong case that's the Trinity, but the traditional view is that they're two angels. God and two angels appear in human form. They look like men. And they have bodies that are so tangible that their feet can be washed by physical water and they eat physical food. How can they eat physical food? How do they digest physical food? Thank you, first last. You're getting it. Dodge, you know you're going to get blocked for presuming to know what you're talking about. Who told you they don't have gender? So is Michael and it? Dodge, stop pontificating police is michael male or female is michael and it do you say michael he is a warrior or it is a warrior or she's a warrior gabriel will you call gabriel gabriella and refer to it as it uh, see the look Send this guy out of here, please. Send him out of here. See what he just did? Send him out of here. See what he just did? I thought I made it clear earlier. If you're holding to traditions of men, imposing on scripture, this is not the place for you. No, you guys must have forgotten Zechariah 5 verse 9. Zechariah 5 verse 9. Zechariah 5, verse 9. Let's read it again. Zechariah 5, verse 9. You forgot it because I mentioned it a while back. See, we're creatures of repetition. We have to hear things over and over again. Mikhail, I'm not going to prove that you're wrong either because you're lying or you don't know. You just said every such being is male, right? Mikhail, you're either a liar or you don't know what you're talking about. Zechariah 5, 9. Then lifted I up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came out two women, and the wind was in their wings. Are you now going to take back what you just said? You said every celestial being is male. Here are two women with wings, and they're female. You see why I say stop speaking in ignorance and pontificating. So, Mikhail, were you lying or you're ignorant? Which is it? Zechariah 5, 9. See what happens when you're not patient and you open your mouth and pontificate? Thank you, Ura. Do you like bald bastard aliens? Zechariah 5, verse 9. Zechariah 5, verse 9. Mikhail, I need to hear from you. Were you wrong? 
Then lifted I up mine eyes, and looked, and behold, there came out two women, and the wind was in their wings, for they had wings like the wings of a stork. Will you now hesitate to say something and pontificate and be patient? Now, typically people think that these female creatures were unclean creatures because they had the wings of, of a stork, and stork is an unclean animal according to the dietary restrictions of Moses. I didn't block you, Shalom Lord. I don't know what you're talking about. Pete D., so in every other vision of Zechariah where he sees the angel of the Lord and angels in front of him, those are not real angels because it's a vision, Pete D. You really want to go there, Pete D? Pete D, the same Zechariah has visions where he sees the angel Lord standing in front of him. He sees Satan in the vision. He sees other angels. So just because it's a vision, that means he's not really seeing spirit beings? Pete D, see again? What does it being a vision have to do with the fact that even in visions you can see actual realities? I don't get it. I don't I don't I don't understand what you got. Okay, Pete D, let me ask you another question. Let me ask you another question. On the Mount of Transfiguration, Pete D, did Peter, James, and John actually see Jesus transfigure physically before their eyes? And did they actually see Moses and Elijah on the mount. Was it an actual appearance of these entities? Pete D. Thank you, Paul Simons. Thank you. You're being teachable and open. Thank you, Jonathan Simon. But I just want Pete T to answer that question. Did Peter, James, and John actually see Jesus physically transfigure on the mount and actually see Moses and Elijah, although they were disembodied spirits, they saw their spiritual shapes and recognized them? Did they actually see these beings, Pete D? Okay, he said yes, but Pete D, Jesus said that was a vision. Matthew 17, verse 9. Jesus said that he saw a vision, Pete D. Matthew 17, verse 9. Let's quote it. So just because it's a vision, they were not seeing actual realities. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them saying, tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be, be risen again from the dead. Thank you, DFED. Thank you, brother. You answered correctly. PT, here's another question. Did the Apostle Paul actually see the resurrected, glorified Christ in his physical glorified body. Was it an actual appearance of Jesus that commissioned him? Did he actually see Christ? Pete D? Waiting, come on, brother. Don't waste time. Because it's live stream, people don't want to wait too long. That's what they tell me. Don't interact with comments, but I have to. I interact with comments because I want to make sure you're getting it. Jericho, we're not talking about the future. Paul saw Jesus on his way to Damascus that knocked him down and blinded him. Did Paul see Jesus? Actually see him? Come on, Pete. We got to move on, brother. Acts 26, 19, Paul said that was a vision. Acts 26, 19, not even with spirit eyes, Jonathan. He saw him with physical eyes. That's why he was physically blinded, Jonathan. Acts 26, 19, whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. Pete D., you, you have no idea what you're talking about, and you're insulting my intelligence. 2 Corinthians 12, 2-4, Paul is not talking about when he saw Jesus that knocked him down and blinded him, leading to his conversion. 
2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2 to 4, is talking about a different experience when he was taken to the third heaven, to the paradise of God. Why are you confusing the two? I'm talking about when the risen Jesus appeared to Saul and said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Paul says that was a vision he saw. Acts 26, 19. Okay. So why bring up that it's a vision? What are you actually trying to prove by telling me it's a vision? Nothing. So what it's a vision? You mean people can't see actual realities in visions? Not saying that everything they see in a vision is an actuality. It may be a symbol pointing to something. But in Zechariah 5 verse 9, what would the symbol of women with wings point to? What would the image of women with wings symbolize? So can you guys stop pontificating, assuming you know more about heavenly realities than you actually do? And I'm saying that to myself. It's not just you. We do not know what heaven is like apart from revelation. And in God's revelation, we're not told everything about heaven or how angels function. So then how can you pontificate and tell me what an angel can and cannot do? Are you God? No. Are you a prophet? No. Are you an apostle? No. Have you seen heaven? No. So how are you going to tell me what an angel can and cannot do? Right? And where did you get that angels are only males? Or let me be more clear. Spirit beings are only males. Spirit creatures are only males. Where did you get that from? Where did you get that from? You got it from traditions of men. And I sound like a broken record over and over and over again. Do you want to be biblical, biblicist, following the Bible as accurately as possible and then living it out by the power of the Holy Spirit, which I fail miserably, Lord have mercy on me? Or do you want to keep sticking to traditions that override the Bible, making the Bible agree with what you want it to say or what your church says? But then don't blame the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons for doing the same thing when they force the Bible to agree with their doctrines because you're doing the same thing. Thank you, Jod Inc., 100%. They're imposing their definition of what a myth is and what a vision is. Thank you, Jod Inc., as opposed to understanding it in its historical, cultural, or biblical context. Exactly, Bill Mandalay. In heaven, angels don't sleep with each other, Bill Mandalay. But angels were not sleeping with each other. They came to earth to sleep with women of the earth. You see, Bill Mandalay? That too is misquoted, Bill Mandalay. No, see, Jesus said, when we are there at the children of resurrection, you know, we're going to be like angels. Yeah, no one said angels in heaven have sex with each other. But that's why Jude says they left their first estate. They're not having sex with each other. They're leaving heaven to have sex with women on earth. How does that passage refute anything? Right? Because that's quoted. Well, Jesus said angels don't get married. You know, the angels of heaven don't get married. So when we, when we re resurrect it, when God raises us from the dead, we're going to be children of resurrection. We're going to be like angels. All right. Hold on. Jesus is talking about angels in heaven don't procreate with each other. Don't have sex with each, with, with each other. What does that got to do with angels leaving heaven? Like Jude chapter 1 verse 6 said, leaving their first estate, leaving their celestial dwelling, coming to the earth to have sex with women on earth. Who's saying angels are having sex with each other in heaven? 
That's the travesty and the abomination of what they did. They left heaven so they can have sex with creatures of a different genus. Right? So are you learning that we do not know much about heaven? Yes, Zena, angels have many desires. If angels can sin, that means they have desires that can corrupt them. Why couldn't they have sexual desires, Zena? How do they sin? Because they have desires. Desires that are sinful. Desires that are contrary to the will of God. So why can't they have sexual desires? Which would be contrary to God for their life. You get it, Zena? Good question, by the way. And good, good point, sort of truth. Defit, she knows what she meant. I know what she meant. She's talking about spirit creatures, spiritual beings who are commonly referred to as angels. No, in the new heavens and earth, that desire to have sex will be removed because we won't have any need to reproduce the human race. Right? Angels will also be transformed in such a way in the new heavens and earth that they too will not be able to sin anymore. Defid, no one is disagreeing that the term angel in a broader sense simply means messenger and can refer to humans. That's not what she's asking me. And you know that's not what she's asking me, Defid, because my context was we being like angels in heaven. So why are you guys trying to pontificate again? Right? Okay. Let me ask the question again. In Genesis 18, in Genesis 18, God and two angels appear as men, human beings in human bodies, and it says they ate physical food that Abraham prepared. Question for every one of you. God had not become an actual flesh and blood human being. He simply appeared, assumed a human appearance, a human body, but didn't actually become human by nature, and did the angels. How then was God and those two angels capable of eating and digesting human food? How? I don't know how, but I know they did it, right? Unless you're going to deny Genesis 18. Right? Defit helped me to help you by not helping me. They did it, right? Let me give you another passage. Hebrews 13, verses 1 to 2. Hebrews 13, verses 1 to 2. And if after this you take the material and study it and think I'm wrong, fine. Let me repeat again. You don't have to believe the way I believe. Take my arguments, prayerfully study over them, ask the Spirit to guide you into all truth and guide me into all truth. Correct us when we're wrong. And be humble enough to accept correction. And if you disagree with me, that's okay. We don't need to fight about it. Don't bring it up. Don't send me comments because that's not going to help me. You trying to prove me wrong. Let the spirit work in me if I'm, I'm wrong. Okay. Now Hebrews 13 verses 1 to 2. Hebrews 13 verses 1 to 2. Let brotherly love continue. Notice verse 2. Zena and everyone else. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Wow. It says, when you have a human stranger coming to you, entertain that human stranger because it may be an angel appearing as a human stranger to test your hospitality. Folks, this goes back to what we find in Genesis 18 and 19. Two angels appeared as men. Upon whom initially neither Abraham nor Lot recognized who they were until later. Right? So now an angel comes to my house. I don't know it's an angel. He's a human being. He enters my house. He sleeps in my house. And I give him breakfast. And he eats. 
How in the world is he able to sleep on a bed or sit on my couch? How in the world can he eat what I offer him or drink what I give him when he's not a physical being and doesn't have a human digestive system? I don't know, but they can do it, and they have done it according to the Bible. Right? Now, let me show you something about manna. You remember the bread that Israel ate in the wilderness? Manna? Wait, well, let me blow your minds away. Exodus 16, verses 4 to 8. Guys, pay attention. We're almost done with this session. Exodus 16, verses 4 to 8. Wait, first, last. Be, be, be patient, bro. I know you're excited. Thank you, Shalom, Lord. That means if they can appear in human form, they can do human activities, such as even sex. Thank you, Shalom, Lord. That's my point. Okay, but wait. Exodus 16, 4 to 8. Read, read. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven. Pay attention. Which heaven? The sky above? Wait. Read. Please, you got to read carefully. If you don't read carefully, you're going to miss it. I'm going to bring bread from heaven. Which heaven, Lord? The sky, space, or your dwelling place, your heavenly dwelling place? Then said the Lord Jehovah unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them, test them, whether they will walk in my law or no. And it shall come to pass that on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. Why? Because notice 6 and 8, read again, 6. And Moses and Aaron said unto all the children of Israel, At even, at evening time, then you shall know that Jehovah the Lord, Yehovah, hath brought you out of, from the land of Egypt. And in the morning, then ye shall see the glory of Jehovah, the cloud, that's what he meant by glory, for that he heareth your murmurings, your complaining, your grumbling against Jehovah. And what are we that you murmur against us? And Moses said, this shall be when Jehovah shall give you in the evening flesh to eat and in the morning bread to the full. The flesh that God was going to give them were quails, these birds. But if you read Exodus 16 carefully, it says the quails did not come from heaven. An east wind blew them. An east wind blew the quails into the desert, meaning the quails came from the earth. But this bread came from heaven, came from heaven. In the morning, bread to the full, for that Jehovah heareth your murmurings, which ye murmur against him, right? Ye murmur against him. <clears throat> and what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against Jehovah. Now let's read Exodus 16, verse 15. Exodus 16, verse 15. Front end and cut. Stop the side conversations about the Apocrypha. Stop. Pay attention. Exodus 16, verse 15. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, it is manna. For wist they did not know what it was. For wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, this is the bread which Jehovah hath given you to eat. Do you know what manna means, by the way? Do you know why they called it manna? Look at your lexicon to confirm this. They called it manna because right here it tells you. They called it manna because they did not know what it was. Folks, listen to me. They did not know what it was. Why would they not know what it was if it's from the earth? And the word manna comes from man who means, what is this? What is this? What's this? They didn't know what it was. But the quails they knew because they knew it was from the earth. But the bread, they didn't know what it was, so they called it, what is this? What's this? Can you imagine calling food what's this because they didn't know what it was? You understand? They called it what's this. We don't know what it is. It's not from the earth. We've never seen it, so we're going to call it, hey, what's this? Hey, can you pass me some of that what's this? You with me there? That's what it means. I'm not lying to you. 15 told you. Exodus 16, 31 to 34. Exodus 16, 31 to 34. Many, many of you know where I'm going with this because you already know, you already see. Exodus 16, 31 to 34. 
Watch here. And the house of Israel called the name thereof manna. Why? They called it manna. They didn't know what it was. And it was like coriander seed. See, it's likening it to things on earth. It's like this. We don't know what it is, but it's like this. It's like coriander seed. It's white. And the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. That's what it tasted like. That's what it looked like. But it's none of that. This is the closest example we can give you, right? Now read 32, 34 with me. And Moses said, this is the thing which Jehovah commanded. Fill an omer of it to be kept for your generations. Fill an omer and preserve this for future generations as physical proof. God is real and he's your God and he saved your ancestors. That they may see the bread wherewith I have fed you in the wilderness when I brought you forth from the land of Egypt. And Moses said unto Aaron, take a pot and put an omer full of manna therein and lay it before Jehovah to be kept for your generation as the, as the Lord Jehovah commanded. As the Lord Jehovah commanded. Moses, so Aaron laid it up before the testimony to be kept. Everyone there? Jericho, you don't need to post, please, brother. You're going to distract Protestant. Guys, you have a brain ass who's upset that he doesn't know his father, father is because his mother gave birth to him, a dog. Send him out of here. Okay, now, Psalm 78, write this down. Come on, admins. Be quick, bro. Come on, guys. Why are you dropping the ball? I see him before you guys see him. Psalm 78, 23 to 29. Pay attention to verse 24, 25. Psalm 78, verses 23 to 29. Pay attention to 24 and 25. Why did they know what this bread was? Because it wasn't from the earth, from this world. It wasn't from here. That's why it says it came from heaven. Which heaven? The sky above? Space? Or God's heavenly abode? Let's read. Psalm 78, 23 to 29. Pay attention to 24 and 25. Please, let's work together and focus. Though he had commanded the clouds from above and opened the doors of heaven, bam! He opened the doors of heaven. He opened the door to the spiritual dimension where God dwells with angels. The doors of heaven were open, and from there rained down manna upon them to eat and had given them of the corn of heaven, meaning the grain of heaven. Men did eat angels' food. He sent them meat to the full. He caused an east wind to blow in, in the heaven, and by his power he brought in the south wind. Let's read 27, 29, 27, 29. He rained flesh also upon them as dust and feathered fowls like as the sand of the sea. So the east wind blew the fowls from the sky to them, whereas the doors of the spiritual dimension called heaven opened and the bread came down out of that dimension, not from the sky, like the quails came from the sky, right? And he let it fall in the midst of their camp, round about their habitations. So they did eat and were filled, for he gave them their own desire. Did you notice why they didn't know what the bread was? Because it came out of the heavenly dwelling place of God. That's why it says the heavens open and it came down, whereas the quail was blown in by an east wind and fell from the sky. But that bread came out of heaven when heaven opened. And we're expressly told this is the grain in heaven. Grain made in heaven what angels eat. Could the Bible be any clearer? Even angels in heaven have food that they eat. Exactly, Protestant. This is angel's food cake. Because remember it says it was sweet like honey. You get it now? Folks, you understand what you're reading here? Angels are designed in such a way they can resemble us, take our appearance, eat our food, and we're designed in such a way we can eat their food and live in their dimension. So though this dimension is made of a different substance, this heavenly dimension where angels dwell, it is a dimension of time, space, and place 
though it's made of a different substance from the earthly elements, still it's similar enough that we can dwell there and they can dwell here. They can eat our food and we can eat their food. You caught it? Everyone got it or no? The reason why they called it manna, because manna means what's this? What is it? They didn't know what it was because it was not from the earth. It was from God's heavenly place. And it says it's the corn, the grain of heaven, what angels eat. So number one, who told you angels don't eat? Number two, who told you angels are genderless? Who told you that? The Bible didn't tell you that. The Bible did not tell you that. Your traditions did. So, folks, let me ask you a question. If angels can look like us and assume human form, and in that human form eat our food without having human digestive tract, and we know angels do have gender. You have male angels like Michael and Gabriel, and then you have those two women with the wings of a stork, so they're female. So if they can perform human activities such as eat, why can't they perform human activities such as sexual intercourse when they assume those human bodies on earth? Why can't they? Who told you they can't? The wings were like a stork. Doesn't mean they are storks. Who told you they can't? Joan Ark, why are you coming in lately chiming in on something that I already addressed? Joan of Ark, I already addressed that a couple of minutes ago. Well, obviously, their offspring had genetics, human genetics from their mothers. Right, Paul? Now, you're asking me to venture into things that the Bible doesn't tell me, so you want me to speak on issues where God is silent. Dangerous territory, my friend. Let me remind you of a verse again. Deuteronomy 29, 29. But Paul Simons, that's why I'm trying to check your curiosity because your curiosity can tempt you to then venture into areas that you have no right to venture and then sin and go beyond what is written. And I'm trying to protect you as a brother who loves you for the sake of Christ. Deuteronomy 29, 29, Paul. The sacred things belong unto Jehovah our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. There are things that the Bible tells us that is sufficient but it doesn't go into great depth and it doesn't tell us everything because there are things that God keeps to himself. I can only tell you what I read, but I can't go beyond what is written and venture too much into speculation because then I may tread on dangerous ground. Exactly, just, Justin Mitchell. God bless you. Some questions don't need answers right now. Precisely. But what I can tell you is the Bible is clear. Angels can resemble men, look like men, take on human appearance, have human bodies, eat human food. And angels also have their own food in heaven that they eat that we can eat. Did you catch it? The spiritual dimension called heaven, though it's made of a different substance from the earth, still it is a dimension of time, space, and place. Like the earth is a dimension of time, space, and place, right? But they're different substances, but they're similar enough that the angels can eat our food on earth and we can eat their food in heaven and we can go there and dwell and they can come down here and dwell. Profound differences, but a lot of similarities. So here's my question again. If the Bible is clear, angels do eat their own food and can eat human food by assuming human bodies that are so tangible that you can touch them, be touched by them, and even have feet that can be washed, so they're able to perform human activities, on what solid exegetical grounds can you then tell me they can't also perform, perform the human function of sex and get a woman pregnant? 
especially if the Bible says that's what they did. Especially if Genesis 6, 2 to 4 is clear, those are angels who got women pregnant. How? I don't know, and I don't want to find out. Right? And remember I said, every myth, all myths originate from a kernel of historical truth, right? That myths are not simply stories made up of a thin air. They're based on historical events that have been embellished and blown out of proportion, right? Right? Thank you, Raz Qureshi. Right? Well, is it coincidental that in all ancient myths, they have no problem with gods and goddesses from a different dimension getting human beings pregnant or being pregnant by them? Where are they coming up with this? They're not making it up. It's based on an event that took place that these civilizations knew, ran with, embellished, and blew out of proportion. D Rock, you know you're gonna get blocked for that stupid comment insulting Protestants out of your arrogance and stupidity, saying that Protestants are out of their mind for rejecting Tobit. If you want me to embarrass you by quoting Tobit to show you some of its teachings that are quite embarrassing, I will. But you're leaving my channel, never coming back. Get this dog out of here for being that stupid for attacking Protestants. Go smash your head on a rock. You guys still don't understand and still don't learn, right? Freedom in Christ, I have no idea what you're talking about and what you're smoking. What is I? Freedom in Christ. Hold on. Freedom in Christ, I don't know what you're smoking. Put it down, son. You got to repent. Isaiah 43 is talking about the Israelites as God's covenant people who bear his name. What in the world does that have to do with angels called sons of God? Are you starting your nonsense? Thank you, DFID. You're getting it. I like Angelo R. Beautiful. I don't know what you mean by what you, you were seeing was a vision. Are you talking to me or someone else? Yeah. No, I know why he's quoting that, a Angelo R. He's quoting Tobit. He thinks I'm stupid. Can I tell you why he was trying to quote Tobit? No, it's not Oriental Orthodox. Angelo, do you know why? Do you do you want me to tell you why he's quoting Tobit? Because he thinks I'm stupid. I don't know what he's quoting. Why he's quoting it. You know why he's quoting it? He's quoting it because Tobit tells, or Raphael tells to uh, Tobias and his wife that even though you saw me sojourn with you, pay attention. You never saw me eating any food. You get it? So he wants to quote Tobit to show that Raphael didn't eat food, which would then contradict Genesis 18 where angels do eat food. You think? You see, he thinks I'm stupid. I'm born yesterday. Al Darish will tell you, though I'm stupid, I'm not as stupid as I look. And I wasn't born yesterday. I was born the day before. No, Raphael says he didn't eat. Reread it again. You thought I ate, but I didn't eat. Reread it again, Angelo. You understand my point? See, he just quoted it first and last. But I did neither eat nor drink. But I did neither eat nor drink. See? So he thinks I'm stupid and I'm born yesterday. He doesn't know. I know where he's going with this and he's going to embarrass himself. Even if Tobit 1219 is saying angels don't eat, all he did was provide further proof why Tobit is in scripture because in Genesis 18, angels did eat physical food. Do you see how stupid this guy is? You understand? The stupidest thing you can do if you believe Tobit is scripture is to make Tobit contradict a book we all accept as scripture. There is no denomination that doesn't believe that Genesis is scriptural. 
No, Angelo, you're still not getting it, brother. If I have to explain to you what he means, I'm going to block you too, Angelo. Let's try this again. He's saying, I didn't eat, but that's how it appeared to you because you wasn't, wasn't seeing a reality. You were seeing a vision, defining vision as something apparent but not actual. What part of that you're not getting? In the context, by vision, he means you're seeing something apparent but not actual. It appeared to you as if I was eating, but that was in your mind, but you were not seeing reality. I wasn't eating. Is he? Send Angela on his merry way then, if he's a Mohammedan. Yeah. Now, for those of you who believe Tobit, I don't know about that. I don't think any woman could handle me and marry me, to be honest. To, to, to those of you who believe Tobit, let me tell you what you don't do. Are you ready? What you don't do. Don't quote Tobit to show the angel Raphael cannot eat. Interpret in such a way that it doesn't contradict the book we all accept as scripture. Okay? What you can say is that Tobit didn't eat, not because he couldn't eat, but he chose not to eat. But he gave them the appearance he was eating so they wouldn't be disalarmed and afraid. But that his statement in of itself doesn't mean angels don't eat. And that way, Tobit won't be contradictory to Genesis 18. You with me there? I'm helping you Orthodox, Catholics, and others who accept Tobit as scripture to not interpret Tobit in such a way to contradict Genesis 18 because we all agree that Genesis 18 is scripture, but we don't all agree about Tobit. Right? So don't interpret Tobit to mean that Raphael can't eat because he's an angel. Interpret it to mean, though angels can eat, I chose not to eat because that's not my purpose, but I gave you the appearance as if I was eating so that you wouldn't be disalarmed and scared. That way, it's now conciliatory with Genesis. But you see, guys, you don't give me enough credit. Because again, I'm not trying to boast, may God crucify my flesh, destroy my pride, and keep me humble and holy and pure in love with Jesus. Lord, please save me from myself. But you guys don't give me enough credit because you think I'm stupid and I haven't read these things so that you're going to catch me off guard. Can you give me a little more benefit of the doubt that I have heard these arguments? I know where you're going when you mention Tobit. I know what you're trying to do because I've been there. I've done it. I've gotten the t-shirt. Right? Because D-Rock thought I was stupid because he's referring to Tobit thinking that he's going to prove that angels can't eat. He didn't know that if I let him stick around, I was going to humiliate him and then repent later. Right? But for the rest of you, what did you learn thus far? Jericho, that's because of the grace of the Holy Spirit empowering me to recall information. Now my prayer is the Holy Spirit will give me the power to live this information in perfect holiness and purity and love of Jesus and walk in holiness. And I pray that for all of us. And he fights for me and my children until Jesus takes me home in Jesus' name. Now, coming back to the issue. What did you learn from this session? You learn that angels can do a lot more than you've been taught. I know that metaverse. I know it doesn't. But it was this know-it-all, this brain ass who thought he was being slick. You have learned exactly, Paul Simons. God bless you for that statement. You have been through the learning process. So we, thank you. If you can be humble enough to put up with me and learn, you're going to avoid a lot of pitfalls and mistakes that I and others have experienced. So we're saving you the time so you can get to where we're at much faster by the grace of God's spirit. You get it? Thank you, Paul, for that statement. We're trying to get you to your goal much faster than it took us because we're teaching you to avoid the mistakes we made as the Spirit uses us in your life. Thank you, Mark Agney. I agree. 
But that gentleman who thought it did, and he was trying to use it against me, little did he realize it was going to humiliate him. And notice, Mark, I don't believe Tobit is scripture, but I am being sympathetic to those who do and helping you explain that passage in a way that doesn't contradict with those books that we accept as scripture. Can you ask more from me than that? I'm helping you defend a book that you believe scripture that I don't believe is scripture. Can you ask more from me than that? That's exactly my point, Mark Agni. I could have just said, see, contradicts Genesis. It's not scripture. For the sake of charity, I'm giving that statement the benefit of the doubt that Tobit is not going to contradict Genesis because as a Jewish writer, he would know Genesis and the story of Genesis and would not have an angel saying angels don't eat altogether because angels do eat. And he would be familiar with Psalm 78. Angels even have bread that they eat in heaven, manna, right? So then whatever Raphael meant, it could not mean angels cannot eat altogether. Thank you. Exactly growing. I know it's in the Septuagint. And actually, no, I, I'm not, I don't want to go by memory. Anyway, coming back to the issue. Coming back to the issue. What did you learn? Angels. Look like us because they can take on human appearance, human semblance, semblance, can even assume a human body that's so tangible that they can eat human food in that human body. Therefore, if they are able to perform human activities and carry out human functions when they appear as humans on earth, why can't they then also perform the human function of sex, even though we may not understand how they do it? But we know they do it if we allow Genesis 6 to say what it says. Genesis 6, clearly the sons of God are angels. And even Jews, like those who wrote Enoch, had no problem with them being angels who came down and had sex with women. So my question to you is, how come those Jews that compiled Enoch, which the letter of Jude alludes to and quotes, saw no problem with angelic beings having the capacity to get women pregnant how come they had no problem mark agni you came a little later into discussion i showed the nephilim are not the demonic human hybrids because these Jews realize angels are able to do a lot more than we think. So what I want you to avoid from now on is assuming that you know a lot more about heaven and how heaven exists, a lot more about angels and how they function than you actually know. How do you know that angels can't have sex? Who told you? Hank Hanegraaff? How do you know that angels can't eat food? Who told you? Hey, can't, where are you getting this from? You're not getting it from Bible, and you're not getting it from Jesus' words. Jesus is not talking about angels leaving heaven, coming to the earth to have sex with, with females, human women. He's talking about angels in heaven don't procreate. They don't have sex with each other to procreate. That's why they left heaven to have sex on earth with women that do. Right? Let's read Jude 1.6 again to confirm this point. And I'm going to leave it with one final point for today. There's one point, point I want to make. Jude 1.6, one more time. Read this with me. Here it explains to you that there is no contradiction between what Jesus says about angels in heaven not marrying and with angels coming to the earth and having sex. Read with me Jude 1, 6. There is no contradiction if you interpret words correctly. Here you go. Jude 1, 6. And the angels which kept not their first estate. There you go. They did not keep their first estate. They left their heavenly estate to come to the earth, but left their own habitation. Could it be any clearer there's no contradiction between what Jesus says about angels remaining in their habitation and then leaving their habitation to come to the earth to do earthly things? Where's the contradiction? 
In fact, can I ask you a question? Angels in heaven, can they eat earthly food? Yes and no. Yes, if it's there. No, if it's not. So it's like saying angels in heaven don't eat steak. And we won't eat steak. The reason why we, they don't eat steak? Because there is no steak in heaven. But what if angels come down to earth? You better believe they'll, they can eat steak because they ate lamb that, that Abraham roasted. Or was it a goat? Sorry. I don't know the difference between goat and lamb. You see my point? What they don't do in heaven doesn't mean they can't do on earth. What they don't do in heaven doesn't mean they can't do on earth. Well, that was a ram for Isaac. It replaced Isaac. Abdel Halaj. Exactly. Ribeye steak. Eat all you can right now. So they can eat things on earth that they don't eat in heaven because the food on earth is not in heaven. Fatted calf, you see? One of my relatives, a cow. Sorry about that. See, I told you. I'm not good animals. Uh, it all looks the same to me if it tastes good. Well, according to the text, they were flooded and destroyed, and those angels, Tommy, were then consigned into outer darkness. Right? See, I can't tell the difference between a goat, a lamb, or a calf because it's all the same if it tastes good. Because I don't look at the animal before it's killed and cooked. I only look at it when it's cooked and ready to go, to eat. So, question, Riaz. Can angels eat calf in heaven? They can if there are calves in heaven, but no, as far as we know, there aren't calves in heaven. Now, maybe I'm shocked. Maybe there'll be. But you get my point, what I'm trying to say? Angels can eat on earth what they don't eat in heaven because the things of earth are not necessarily in heaven. Right? Is that sinking in? Is it making sense? If it's making sense and this challenged you and got you to open up your minds by the power of the Holy Spirit to dig deeper into the word and let the Bible speak and don't make the Bible mute. Don't mute it with your traditions. Don't tell the Bible what it can and cannot say. Let the Bible tell you what is reality and change your thoughts by the power of the Holy Spirit to agree with the Bible, not your pastor or your bishop said, all angels of them are males. They're males. How do you know? In fact, how do you know how many angels are there and what their names are? Now, if you take into consideration Tobit, right, and you believe that scripture, we're given the names of four angels, Raphael, right? Michael, Gabriel, and another angel in Revelation 9, 11 called Abaddon, Apollyon, which means destruction. But if I add Enoch, right? If I add Enoch, then there are other angels. In other words, at most, you may come up with a handful of names of angels. But nowhere in any apocryphal source that I'm aware of and canonical source, are we given the names of all the angels and nowhere are we told that they're all males? How do you know there isn't a Gabriella among them? In fact, folks, can I ask you a question? Here. If we believe that these ancient civilizations were misled and deceived by angelic beings, who came and perverted them and taught them perverse doctrines. How do you explain for the fact that these individuals claim to have seen gods and goddesses and worshipped goddesses if there aren't fallen female angels? And then when you add Zechariah chapter 5 verse 9 into the mix, Zechariah 5 verse 9 tells us, Zechariah in a vision saw two women with the wings of storks. What more proof do you need? Andrew, I hope you've been blessed, brother, because you're awfully silent. I don't know what he said. Did he say something? Because he usually says something very profound. All right? So let me end it with this. Let me destroy another myth. Another myth. 
you'll be told that spirit beings are genderless, baloney. And you'll be told that God is genderless, baloney. Can I prove to you that's baloney? And none of you really believe that? But you're just saying that to sound intelligent or to agree with those who think they're intelligent? You want me there? Okay. Do you believe that God the Father has always been the Father eternally? The Father. Do you believe Jesus Christ has been the eternal Son, eternally the Son, before creation? If you say yes, you just refuted that assertion. Because you're telling me God is the Father, not Father and Mother. And he wasn't God is the mother, and that Jesus was the son, not the son and daughter. So if he is the father in eternity, and Jesus is the son in eternity, that means the father wasn't the mother in eternity, and the son wasn't the daughter in eternity, so that somehow gender is bound up with the identity of God. But here's where people get confused. They assume that if you have gender, you must have genitalia. No, that's not true. You can have gender without genitalia. It so happens that in the physical realm, to be male gender also encompasses and includes physical genitalia to distinguish you from the female who has her unique genitalia. But let me ask you a question. Okay, let me ask you a question. If I die and growing die today, she's female and I'm male. We're both in heaven. Will you still recognize me even though I don't have a physical body? You'll still, still know that Sam and I won't look like a Samantha? And will she still be she? Will she still be she? Will I still be a he? Oh, wait, growing. How can you be a she? You don't have genitalia. How can I be a he? I don't have genitalia. You see how much tradition has poisoned us. Right? In heaven, there is gender distinction. Without this implying that those that have specific genders have specific genitalia that go with it. So then what does that mean with in reference to angels who got women pregnant? I am not saying that angels have genitalia by nature. I'm saying that when they come to this realm, they can assume a human body and that human body have specific genitalia that they can use to get women pregnant. That's my point. Clear? And God willing, I'll talk about the forbidden tree and the serpent seed theory next time when I do a live stream. Next time when I do a live stream, God willing, I will address whether the tree of the knowledge of good and, not, uh, and evil is a euphemism for sexual intercourse and whether the devil actually got Eve physically pregnant because that is a very popular teaching among some. Okay? Before I move on and end the session, everything understood thus far. Everything that I shared, and I tried to share as accurately as possible without being boring, trusting the Spirit to guide the conversation for glory of Christ. Do you see the depth of Scripture? Do you see the challenges posed by Scripture to some of the traditional views we've been taught? And why we need to be humble and not presume that we know more about a subject than we really do. Right? Go back, re-listen to these sessions, hit the like button, pass them on to others, and if the Spirit shows you I'm wrong, pray He'll show me where I'm wrong. But if I'm right, may He confirm it in our hearts and give us the power to live for the glory of Christ. And guys, please pray, the new year is coming, that if I'm around, God will do a miracle. Set me free from these satanic shackles to enter the new year free from this corrupt legal system, this whore judge, this daughter of Satan, and to have my daughters in my life. I'm tired, folks. I'm fatigued and I'm lonely as heck because I don't have my girls, my two angels, pray for them. I love them, right? 
And someone's telling me, me and my next life are going to have some interesting conversations. Folks, let me let me be upfront with you. I think I have too many issues to be able to make any woman happy. The woman who marries me has to be sold out for Christ to deal with someone like me. So I think it's a gift of grace that if the Lord gives me the grace, I will just remain celibate like Paul until Christ calls me home because I don't want to be a burden on anyone. It's 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 hard to live with someone like me, right? Just ask, who can you ask? You can't ask anybody. Just like it's hard to deal with Zena, which is why Zena may consider opening up a Protestant monastery for nuns and she'll be the first Protestant nun. Just kidding. <laughs> No matter what you do, I'm going crazy. I'd rather be alone. And Sahi Christian makes a powerful case why he needs to be a eunuch like the old eunuchs. And when I say eunuch, I'm talking about being castrated. Like origin, a church father was castrated. So Sahi Christian, you make a strong case that we should still perform castrations. No matter what you do, and you'll be the first one. I'll be going crazy. I'd rather be alone. Pray God will protect the finances. Store this money so I can use it again on my feet. And that these wicked, greedy lawyers won't come after them. Pray protection that the Lord will save me from them getting their hands on it. Right? Lord willing, I'll try to do a session tomorrow. We'll talk about the serpent seed theory. The tree of the knowledge and good and evil. Was that a euphemism for sex? And does that mean that the serpent actually had sex with Eve and got her pregnant? Because that is a popular teaching that many have bought into and have been affected by. And I was affected by it early in my Christian walk. So Lord willing, tomorrow we'll talk about it, right? If the Lord Jesus wills. Christ is risen, risen indeed. May he cover us by his blood, fill us with his love, fill us with the spirit, cover our loved ones, my daughters, by your blood, Lord Jesus. Fill them with your love and your spirit and fight for us. We need you, Jesus. Fight for us and save us from the evil one. We love you, son of God, the very heart of the father, and you are our heart. Our hearts belong to you forever. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Take care.